Okay, Jeff. So thank you, Michelle. Michelle Hi, Managing Editor, American Purpose. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for spending this next hour with us. We'll go to 1 p.m. Eastern hard stop. Our guest of honor is Professor Barry Strauss. He is Bryce, the Bryce and Edith M. Ba Balmer, Professor in Humanities at Cornell University. He is a fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's an author of a number of important books. You know him as a leading expert on ancient military history. If I may also say, with pleasure and pride, he's the author as well of a lovely, lovely tribute for American purpose to historian Donald Kagan, who died last year in August. If Michelle's able, I'd ask her to put that in uh, chat. It's just a, a charming, meaningful tribute. So Barry, welcome to you. Congratulations on the book and thanks for spending time with us today. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's, really, it's really a privilege to be here. I'm so glad. So here's the book. Let me hold it up. I'm not very good at holding up on Zoom screens and I'm trying to work out here. I'm in New York today in a room I'm not familiar with. But there we are. It is called The War That Made the Roman Empire. Uh, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. The book is wonderful, a terrific read. It is recreation in detail of the Battle of Actium. I'm gonna ask Barry a handful of questions to get us going. Then we open it to the gallery. We have tremendous expertise in the room today. First things first, Barry, why did you write the book? And you tell us in the book uh, and you make clear in the press materials related to the book, why now and why it's relevant. It's history, but it's relevant. Can you start with why you wrote the book and why it's a useful read today? Well, I wrote the book because in 1978, I was a graduate student at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. And we went on a field trip uh, to Northwestern Greece and we went to uh, the site of the Battle of Actium. Uh, and there where uh, uh, Octavian had had his headquarters, there were the ruins of a victory monument. And with me were two fellow students who little did I know would devote their careers to reconstructing the archeology span of that monument. Uh, Professor William Murray in the University of South Florida and Konstantinos Zakos in the Greek Archaeological uh, Service, uh, done fantastic work. Uh, and what they, came, what, they, what they did really has had big influence on our understanding what happened at the battle and what Antony's strategy was. So that's one reason, uh, that, that's my personal reason why I wanted to write about this book. Uh, uh, I wanted to bring their work, I wanted to absorb their work and bring it to a larger public. Uh, secondly, um, there was one mystery that I felt had never really been uh, solved. And that is what happened six months before the battle because Actium was a campaign as well as a battle. Uh, and that is the, uh, the successful attack by sea, uh, the seizure of Antony's major supply point in Southwestern Greece, about 150 miles south of Actium, a place called Methoni. And I wanted to try to reconstruct how that happened. Uh, how might that have taken place? Luckily for me, I, I did a stint as a visiting professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, Monterey. Uh, and I was able to talk to professionals who, whose job is to assault places by sea. So I've got some really interesting feedback on that. Um, I, I've long been interested in the role of uh, women in ancient history. Um, and uh, to some extent, I felt that one of the women in the story, Octavia had been completely underrated. Uh, she's usually presented as the long suffering wife of uh, Antony, but I think she was also a very shrewd political actor uh, who was working uh, in part for her brother Octavian. So I wanted to tell her story as well. And then the whole story of Actium in the battle is just, and the war is so fascinating, so utterly captivating. So those are some of the reasons why I wanted to tell this story. So thank you. Could you say a word about the methodology? Uh, you note 
early on, or it is noted about the book perhaps, uh, that uh, you rely on existing scholarship, but draw on your own original research. What did you do? How did you go about it? So um, my research was uh, both um, mostly a matter of library research uh, and a certain amount of interviewing people. Uh, I had been to Actium, the site, twice in the past. I was planning a third trip, but COVID took, got in the way, so I wasn't able. I had to do that virtually through Google Earth and through writing to people in the vicinity to get their uh, advice about certain really nitty gritty questions about wildlife, for instance, and the kind of birds you would find and the way the sea looks at different times of the day. Uh, but uh, for the surprise attack on Methoni, I wanted to know how you did a surprise attack going from sailing from Italy to Greece uh, early in the sailing season. So I read up a lot on navigation, ancient navigation in the Mediterranean. There's been a lot of really good research done in recent years, fortunately for me. And I spoke to a lot of sailors, uh, both uh, naval personnel and recreational sailors uh, and to get some ideas about sailing. I have my own experience as an amateur rower, which was useful to some extent about understanding the boats in the yeah. battle, not so much for, for sailing. So those are some of the things that I did. And, a great deal of archaeological evidence to sift through as, as well as the literary evidence and to study a battle like this as any classes could tell you to study anything in ancient history you have to read you know that's not enough to read the ancient sources uh, but you have to read commentaries on the ancient sources because uh, they're very tricky and they're highly tendentious so thank you it, um, you note early on in the book the, the multi-dimensional, multi-faceted uh, uh, quality of the topic at hand. I'm going to read, I'm going to quote from the book. Uh, the war, the real war, was an integrated campaign involving not only armed violence, but also diplomacy, political maneuvering, information warfare, economic pressure. M my question is, actually, I didn't complete that, did I? The real war was an integrated campaign involving not only armed violence, but also diplomacy, political maneuvering, information warfare, economic pressure, and sex. <laughs> you write, and I quote, how did you organize the book? The book is organized in four sections. I'll read them off very quickly. The seeds of war, the plan and attack, the battle, the end game, but there are a number of layers to the story and pieces to each of these four, well, seemingly simple sections. How did you decide how to organize this? And what would you tell the readers as a guide to your thinking and this roadmap? So great question. I mean, personally, as a scholar, I guess I was interested in the story thematically. So I would have loved to do a section on, you know, the surprise attack. And I would love to have done a section on information warfare uh, and maybe even a section on sex and certainly on economic warfare. But I'm a storyteller and you, you can't tell the story that way. You have to tell the story chronologically uh, and you have to make, you have to help the reader along. You can't assume the reader is an expert on the subject. I thought a good place to start would be in the aftermath of the assassination of Julius Caesar in March of 44 BC, a, a, an event that's, if, do I dare say, near and dear to my heart because I'd written a book about it. But I also thought it was a good place to start because it brought in, uh, it brought in the major characters who were all in or around Rome or about to come to Rome around that time. And I thought that was a good thread to follow through the years of the tri second triumvirate and the uh, uh, the wars that that took place between 44 and 31. Um, so that that was the narrative thread that I followed. Uh, but you had to constantly bring in new characters, take out characters. Uh, I think one problem for a, a historian as a, and an author is if I were a novelist, I would try to limit it to just a handful of characters because I think would think that's what my readers would want to 
focus on. But as a historian, I have a cast of thousands. And so uh, it's, it's a matter of balancing concentration on the main characters with bringing in the others who are so important to the tale. I have two more, Barry, before we open it up. Yeah. Uh, battles, as you note, capture the imagination. Mm -hmm. It is often the unconventional tactics executed with surprise that yeah. stay with us. Could you speak to that point and sure. speak to how that comes to play in this account, this story? Sure. So, you know, I call the book The War That Made the Roman Empire, not The Battle That Made the Roman Empire. Because as I said earlier, Actium is part of a campaign, it's part of a war. And it is it is almost a perfect example of something that the Romans don't talk about, but Sun Tzu does. And that is um, that the best way to win a battle is to have uh, achieved so many of your goals before the battle that it simply fall, that victory almost falls into place. And Sun Tzu talks about, sure, what we sometimes translate as strategic advantage. And I think, the Battle of Actium is, is a terrific example of that because Octavian and his Admiral Agrippa um, box in Antony and Cleopatra so that come the day of the battle, uh, the best they can do is break out. They try, they, they leave open the possibility of, of winning a battlefield victory, but they know that probably they're gonna have to settle for breaking out uh, because uh, the underpinnings have been knocked out from under them as a result of the enemy's tactics. And the main thing that the enemy has done is they've attacked Antony's strategy more than his army. And they've attacked his strategy by going on, cutting off his supply lines. And as I said, this coup six months before the Battle of Actium, the seizure by sea of the base at Methoni in the southwestern Peloponnesus, uh, this raid just changes everything in the war and it opens the way for additional raids and additional attacks on Antony and Cleopatra's uh, su uh, supply lines. So I, I think that would be an example of irregular warfare. Um, it's, it's not a conventional battle. It's an unconventional way of fighting. By the same token, uh, we could go into the, the various, the information warfare, which is such an important part of what's going on, and uh, the financial warfare that really puts Octavian and uh, Agrippa, puts Octavian in a corner. He's in a very difficult situation before the, the, uh, the Actium uh, campaign takes place. And it's not to be taken for granted that he was going to win. So let me finish my round and then we uh, will open it up to all of you with a question, how could I not ask about your Cleopatra? She is the master strategist, perhaps often misunderstood, certainly in your account, underestimated. Can you tell those on the line who have not yet read your book, your account of this great figure? Yes, thank you for asking that. Well, um, from people of my vintage at any rate, we tend to think of, Cleo we tend to think of Cleopatra as Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll think of her as Gal Gadot in the future, I don't know. But, um, and certainly Cleopatra was immensely charming and seductive, uh, but she wasn't just charming and seductive, she was also a strategist. She was a brilliant politician and administrator and quite a brutal and bloody one uh, when necessary. Uh, I think if she had won, we would think of her in, uh, as Elizabeth I, or Catherine the Great, or Ma Maggie Thatcher, or Golda Meir, we would think of her as a, a political leader, or Indira Gandhi, we think of her as a political leader, um, a, a ruler, rather than as a, a, a sex object, or love object. Um, we partly think of her that way because of Shakespeare, of course, and Shakespeare, to be fair, fair it doesn't simply present her as a, a love object, but that certainly looms large in the drama. So my Cleopatra uh, is really a strategist, just a brilliant person. I, I think of her when she's with Caesar and her first lover is Julius Caesar. A colleague of mine once said the two of them might've been the two most brilliant people of their age. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think they are just extraordinarily, extraordinary geniuses, each of them. And the, the thought of the two of them to, 
them together uh, seems absolutely electric. Mark Antony wasn't the genius that Caesar was, but Antony too, I think, can be greatly underestimated. Um, he lost, of course, but he's a man who's at the top of the Roman political game for, for 15 years. Uh, and as a general, he's not as successful as one might want, but he's not simply a loser. I mean, he's the victor of Philippi. And well, maybe it says it all about him that he's at his best in retreat. He's magnificent in retreat. Of course, that's not enough to be magnificent in retreat, um, but he is magnificent in retreat. So he's, he's quite a figure as well. And Antony and Cleopatra should not be underestimated as a couple. Barry, thank you very much. Uh, well, we're just about 20 minutes in. That means 40 minutes of discussion great. and comment from the colleagues in the gallery. The floor is open. Use the raised hand function. If I don't see you, it happens. Michelle will send me a text or wave through the screen. And if you'd be kind enough to identify yourself when asking your question or making your comment, who would like to be first? Fritz. Is that you? And if it is, you have the floor. All right, very good. Uh, my name is Fritz Heinz, and, and I'm a by background a military historian who ended up teaching national security studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that regard, I was I, I started your first book that I read was Anatomy of Error, oh. uh, which modern applicability and so on. And and since then, I I've been a fan. So thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your work. And what I'd like to ask you, 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 you've had me intrigued because I heard you talking to a SICE colleague, Elliot Cohen, about this book. And it was an intriguing discussion. And so I want to bring up Shakespeare. And yeah. for the folks here who don't know, you have a very, very interesting take on Shakespeare. And I'll let you elaborate whatever you want on that. But here's, here's what has me so intrigued. Because you made such an interesting argument about Shakespeare, and his understanding of the, these great ancient figures that he, he, he writes, do you incorporate Shakespeare into your class? Do you have the students read or draw on Shakespeare? I don't, but I could and probably I should. So I, you know, I wear the hat of military historian as well. And a lot of the students who I, in my constituency at Cornell, you know, they want to study with me because they want to study military history. So they would rather read about Sun Tzu, they'd rather read Sun Tzu than they would Shakespeare. But of course they would benefit from reading Shakespeare. And it, it's, it's, it's a great idea. Um, reception studies, as they call it, is very much a part of the study of classics nowadays. And I think we have to be cognizant and upfront about the influences upon us. Uh, Shakespeare does very much influence the way we see Antony and Cleopatra, and equally, if not more so, the way we see Julius Caesar. So yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. I should do that. Okay, and, and because my understanding, listening to you and, and Elliot uh, talk about this, you feel Shakespeare has things right in, in general, is pretty good. He has things right. Everything from the asps uh, and, and Cleopatra to a general portrayal, portrayal of character of most of the figures he deals with? I, yes, I mean, I, he, he gets one thing wrong, which we'll talk about in a moment, but um, yes, I think he does get most things right. A, a little bit more perhaps than one should have Cleopatra as the sex object, um, but certainly she did use her charms as part of, part of her, um, keys to success. Uh, the one thing he gets, big thing he gets wrong is that he, he buys the argument in Plutarch that she fled the battle in cowardice. I don't buy that. I actually think that she was carrying out a prearranged retreat and she carries it out really well. So um, I, I think she's, she, she behaves like a master tactician in the battle. Well, very good. I, I, I can't wait to read the book. I'm a little behind on, on stuff I have to read. But before long, I uh, look forward to uh, tackling it. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Fritz. Who would like to be next? Rebecca, our senior editor, Rebecca Burgess. 
Thanks so much, Barry, for being with us. And this follows up on Fritz's question in a way. I would love for you to talk about Octavia and Cleopatra and their kind of um, their tango around Antony. So uh, you'd mentioned Plutarch. There's this wonderful passage where he um, basically says Octavia goes to see Antony after he's already basically forsaken her. Um, but Octavia Caesar allows her to go because he wants it to use it as a pretext to restart the war with Antony. Meanwhile, Cleopatra is suddenly very nervous about Antony seeing Octavia again and kind of rekindling that romance. So, so she feigns that she's dying for love of Antony. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns into this whole kind of strategic quagmire. And I would love for you to kind of talk about how Octavia maybe manipulates that for Rome's ends or not, um, and kind of the personal and the political getting intertwined there. It's it's a great question, and I completely agree that personal and political are intertwined. Um, you know, so much so that you know, as, as, as historians, we have to stop, step back from it, and say, could this really have been true? Could it have been so soap operatic? And I think the answer is yes, it really was, uh, because this is dynastic politics. Uh, I, uh, Octavian is, to, uh, to all intents and purposes, the ruler of Rome, the first king, the first monarch uh, in this re iteration uh, of, of Rome. Um, and so the members of his family play uh, an enormously important role in, in politics and life. I think that uh, Octavian, no less than Cleopatra, uh, uses a mixture of politics and sex appeal or personal appeal, affection, she is, after all, the mother of two of Antony's children, his two of his daughters. Um, and uh, I have to think that one of the one of the um, strands in the story and one of the, the things that's going on is that Octavian knows that he can always make another deal with Antony. He and Antony, they have this stop start career that goes on for over a decade in which now they're gonna to go to war and nope, now they're gonna become allies. And as often in Roman politics, it's the woman who is the go-between. Her marriage to Antony is a political marriage and it cements, at least for a time, the alliance, the political alliance between uh, Antony and Octavian. So when she does you know, make this opening to see uh, Antony at the 10th hour, if not the 11th hour, uh, I think Cleopatra is right to think, where is this going to lead? Uh, might there not be a, uh, a reconciliation? And uh, I think that one of the reasons that Cleopatra doesn't want to leave Antony in the, in the Actium campaign, although there are others who wanted to, is that uh, she's still worried about this. She's worried about this all along. So yeah, I think that, that there is this real possibility of a reconciliation. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you, Rebecca. Who would like to join the conversation next? While you were thinking, I'm going to ask uh, you, Barry, an additional question. My sure. side, I asked you early about methodology. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about <clears throat> process. <clears throat> the book, uh, it's a tremendously complex, meaty topic. Mm -hmm. And you do this storytelling, compelling in, if I subtract footnote, end notes, bibliography, and uh, introduction, it's compact. It's something like 280 pages. I would have imagined something like 680 pages. <laughs> Did you begin with a draft that was four times this long and chiseled down? Or did you begin with a kind of laser focus on what you would include and what you would leave out? Because it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, engaging read, but it's a compact, I, I won't say little, but what you accomplish in 280 pages is remarkable. I'm, I'm very flattered, thank you. And I hope that, I hope it's not too compact. I hope it has enough detail for the readers but um, I think it's in part because I had a classical education uh, that I've always tried to be concise and I try to make conciseness a virtue. Uh, all my books are fairly short. 
Uh, and maybe I'm long-winded when I speak, but when I write, I, I really try to be to the point and be concise. And um, so I, I try to get everything into the story. Uh, Thank you. You say, tell us that you had a classical education. Uh, were you a student of Don Kagan's? I was, yes. Yes. Was. And, and when we invited you, asked you, uh, were uh, fortunate enough to persuade you to write a tribute uh, in honor of Donald Kagan, could, for those who haven't read the tribute yet, could you tell us a little bit about why he was such an engaging and influential teacher of yours? Oh, yeah. I mean, Don was inspiring. He was nothing short of inspiring. He's a very charismatic person. And I think just about everyone who came into contact with, with him noticed that. He was a fantastic lecturer. Uh, and yet he was that rare thing. In addition to being a, a, a fantastic lecturer, as a seminar leader, he did not suck up all the air out of the room. He had this ability to turn the seminars over to the students, both the undergraduates as well as the graduate students. Uh, I, and he created a model for me of, of student-run seminars. Uh, he's also was somebody who made conciseness uh, a virtue. You know, he, nev he never used uh, unnecessary words. Uh, he was also a lot of fun. He was extremely informal. He was extremely friendly. By the same token, he was a very ambitious person. He was always very busy. Uh, it was hard to get his time, but he was very generous with his time to his students and gave you uh, as, much as, as, as much as he could. Uh, he also made history seem important. And uh, you know, he was a living example of the idea that history matters and studying the past and what we think about the past really does inform the present. He taught this, this, this great course called, um, I think, Historical Studies on the Origins of War, which was the basis for his later book on, um, on the origins of war and the preservation of peace. He looked at these, these case studies, the, the Peloponnesian War, the Second Trinic War, if I get them right, World War I, World War II, and then the Cuban Missile Crisis as a war that didn't happen. Uh, to try to get wisdom uh, about the past for the present. And I, I, think, I think it affected all of us students and many of Don's students went on to careers in public service. So uh, he's just a remarkable figure. It was, I was so fortunate to be able to study with him. So thank you. I would like to ask if I may, I would like to bring into the conversation our colleague Patrick Chamorel, uh -huh. who is a lecturer and a senior scholar at Stanford, working currently momentarily now at the uh, Stanford campus in Washington. And I think, Barry, my memory is always terrible. You're an alumnus of Stanford, aren't you? No, I'm not. No, no, I'm an alumnus of Cornell and Yale. Uh, I, okay. I visited the Hoover Institution, so I spent some time at Stanford, but I'm, I don't have any degrees from it. Okay, Nobody's thank perfect. you for that correction. The, the question to you, Patrick, I realize some of you do not have the benefit of having read the book, and that is a disadvantage for this conversation, but, but it, it works anyway because the material is broadly familiar to everybody on this line. Patrick, uh, you heard Barry mention earlier the reference point, at least in US American culture, of Elizabeth Taylor and Cleopatra and, and popular culture and how we frame and orient to some of these things. Could you tell us if, if things come to mind, how this subject matter area, including Cleopatra, is approached and seen in France? Is it different in any appreciable way? Is it very much aligned with the American traditional understanding? Well, Jeb, that, that's a surprise, surprise question, but I'm, I'm willing, of course, to, to, to uh, say, a few words about this, if uh, if they make sense. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Barry, for uh, you know writing the book and and, and talking about it so cogently. I, I I really am looking forward to reading it. Uh, I you know the, the French in, I think you know in general love ancient history, you know, Rome, Athens, and and Egypt, <laughs> and uh, Cleopatra is a, is a, is a of course a, a huge figure. 
in uh, in in that uh, in 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 those in those times, and I think there is a fascination for no question about it. I mean, the, um, now uh, Liz Taylor is uh, obviously you 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 she she was not uh, uh, you know she didn't play a political role the way <laughs> Cleopatra did. So so I guess you know they they are not they don't completely overlap, but. Uh, but um, and uh, and I don't, you know, I don't believe that Liz Taylor will have the the legacy in, in popular culture or in history, you know, that uh, that Cleopatra had. <laughs> but but anyway, um, um, it's an interesting comparison, though. But uh, probably, uh, you know, and, and, and you 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 would be, I'm sure, the first to agree, a partial one, uh, because Cleopatra was such. Uh, had so so many different facets to to her life and 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 and, uh, and, and contribution to to her time. So so I guess that's that's all I, I can say. I mean, uh, but uh, but clearly uh, in in my in, in, in French culture, yes, those those, those characters uh, loom very large. Uh, there's there's always been a fascin fascination for. For them, and, and I, I guess will continue to be the case. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Let's keep the line open and invite the next colleague to ask a question or make a comment. Well, I can ask another one. <laughs> Please do, Rebecca. You're welcome to. Um, I mean, Rebecca is our resident classicist, so uh, she's well positioned to lead this conversation conversation Rebecca over to you back to you please I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the importance of Egypt for Rome so I'm thinking not only of the fact that Antony dies in Egypt um, but also the fact that Pompey before him had died in Egypt in fact there's all these instances of these Romans going to Egypt um, fleeing for their lives and getting their heads cut off um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what what is, I could say, the, the historical, the strategic importance of Egypt, but also the cultural importance of Egypt that it looms so large in these, these stories um, and Rome's ultimate success? That, that's a great question. Thank you. See, see Egypt and die. Uh, <laughs> I think we underestimate Egypt uh, and its importance for, for Rome because Egypt isn't a major power in the world today. Um, and it was uh, under colonial rule. Of course, it's a fantastic and wonderful place, but um, it's tremendously important for, for Rome. Uh, it's extremely wealthy, and whoever controls Egypt will have a huge leg up in Roman politics. It's one of the reasons why the Romans don't annex Egypt, because they don't want any one Roman to have the credit for annexing Egypt and to have the connections uh, and the clients that would go with uh, uh, annexing Egypt. So when Romans conquered a province, uh, the person who got most of the credit tended to pocket the connections, of course they didn't have pockets, but tended to get the connections that were there. And connections are so valuable in Roman life. And connections in Egypt are immensely valuable because it's enormous wealth. Wealth comes from its agriculture. Uh, it's one of the most fertile places in the ancient world. Uh, along with Sicily, the Po River Valley, and Ukraine, uh, which is a major source of green in the ancient world as it is today. Uh, when Antony forms this liaison with Cleopatra, this sets off alarm bells for Octavian because he says, this guy's gonna have the access to all this wealth. And it really makes a difference. Antony's fleet, for instance, at Actium is a freebie. It's paid for mostly by Cleopatra and the treasury of Egypt. Octavian has to raise taxes in Italy, and that leads to riots because people are so unhappy about it. So, so Egypt's very important. Culturally, it's a powerhouse. It hasn't been so much up to this point. To a degree, it has the cult of the goddess Isis. It becomes e even more of a powerhouse culturally in the empire after it is a next. Uh, and we can only imagine how much more important it would have been yet had Antony and Cleopatra had won, in which case Alexandria would be would have been something like a second capital to, to Rome. Uh, you're right that Egypt can also be a fatal place. 
Pompey. Pompey dies there. Caesar has to fight for his Caesar has to fight for his life there. Um, so yeah, it's it's tremendously important. And even after after uh, Octavian's victory at Actium, uh, Cleopatra doesn't become a non-country in Rome. On the contrary, uh, Egyptomania uh, affects Roman art, and in various ways, Egypt goes on to 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 influence Roman culture in big ways uh, uh, in, in the empire. Thank you, Rebecca. Could we, Barry, return to the subject of propaganda, yeah. the information war? I was looking for a quote, I can't find it, about uh, uh, information and propaganda being used against Cleopatra. Uh, I can't find it, but would you take up that subject, please? Sure. So Octavian, uh, partly because it's his bent, it's his forte, information is his forte, but also because he is at something of a disadvantage. He uses information uh, greatly in his campaign. So do Antony and Cleopatra, I can talk about them too. But Octavian, first of all, claims to discover Antony's will, which is uh, deposited with the Vestal Virgins in Rome. And he breaks the law and he, uh, he makes them give him the will. Uh, and then he claims to read the will in the Senate. Uh, and he says that the will um, shows that Antony is um, giving the store away to Cleopatra, that he wants to be buried next to Cleopatra in, in Alexandria, wherever he is when he dies. And that he recognizes uh, Cleopatra's son, Cizek, uh, Caesarian or Caesarian, as the legitimate heir to Julius Caesar, which is a big problem for Octavian, who goes by the name of Julius Caesar. He was adopted by Caesar in a somewhat, um, somewhat um, questionable manner. Uh, on top of that, uh, Antony, Octavian claims that Antony is giving away provinces in the Roman Empire to his children by Cleopatra and to Cleopatra himself, herself, which is a great exaggeration. And finally, uh, Octavian does not declare war on Antony. He knows that would be uh, very unpopular, if not disastrous, because it would be a civil war. Rome's had enough of civil wars, and he has personally promised never to fight a civil war again. So instead, he declares war on Cleopatra. It's a problem because there's no real casus belli. What has Cleopatra done to justify a war against Rome? And so Ant Octavian has to manufacture the story that um, she has uh, manipulated uh, Antony, she's unmanned Antony, and she has got him, talked him into giving up Rome's interests on behalf of Egypt, and turning him in, in effect into a traitor. Uh, and this is a total exaggeration of the, uh, the reality. We're not able to reconstruct Antony's propaganda against Octavian as well, because his side of the story doesn't survive. Oh, Octavian also accuses Antony of being a drunkard, an alcoholic, someone who's unable to control himself. It's probably true that Antony does enjoy a good time a lot more than Octavian does. But the real story is that Antony identifies himself with the god Dionysus uh, in during the, the more than a decade that he's the ruler of the Roman East. Why Dionysus? Of course, he's the god of wine. And, you know, the Roman version of Dionysus is Bacchus, but he's not just a party boy. He's also the god who the ancients believe has con conquered Asia and no less a conqueror than Alexander identified himself with Dionysus. He's also the god of liberation. So by identifying himself with Dionysus, uh, Antony saying, I am uh, the successor to Alexander the Great and I'm going to conquer Asia, which is in fact what he wants to do. He wants to defeat the Parthian Empire in, in battle, if probably not to conquer all of Parthia, but certainly to defeat it and conquer a part of it. Um, with Cleopatra, he is Cleopatra's consort. Cleopatra ident displays herself as both the goddess Isis and the goddess Aphrodite. And when she meets Antony in the famous entrance, the grand entrance of Tarsus, which Shakespeare describes so magnificently, 
uh, she tells him that the goddess Aphrodite has come to make merry with Dionysus for the control of all of Asia. And these are not just trills. Uh, these are a way of using propaganda uh, to say that Antony and Cleopatra have the gods behind them. They have all the power of Asia behind them. So uh, they're on a campaign against Octavian as well. And, and Antony portrays Octavian as not a legitimate Roman noble. It's not so obvious to us today, but Rome is an extremely snooty society. Uh, the nobility looks down on anyone who's not a member of the inner circle of the Roman elite. And Octavian has a problem. He's not a member of the inner circle of the Roman elite. His mother's mother uh, comes is a member of the Julie, Julie Kaiseres. She's Julius Caesar's sister. But his mother, uh, his, uh, his mother was married to uh, um, a, a rather, uh, his grandmother was married to, his mother's married to a rather unimportant person. Um, actually, his grandmother is married to a rather unimportant person, excuse me. His mother came from a, uh, a, a non-noble family, and he himself is the child of a non-noble father, Gaius Octavius. Uh, he is uh, a member of the Julia Kaiseries only by adoption and on his mother's side. And the Romans look down on this, and, and Antony, who's a full-blooded Roman noble, uh, makes much of this and says, he's not really one of us. He's really not one of us. We can't trust this guy. So there's some of the ways in which the two sides is propaganda. Thank you. Here's what I'd like to do. I would like to read a question in chat by Jonathan Rausch, who is unable to ask it, but it's a good question. It's worth reading. I'll do that in a moment. Then we'll go to Avi Tucker, back to Fritz, and then we'll see where we are. We're 15 minutes to go. Right. Let me call up and read this question, if I may, from Jonathan. And thank you, Jonathan. Uh, as Augustus Octavian became a great administrator and state builder, any conjectures about how the empire might have developed if Antony and Cleopatra had defeated him? Hi, Jonathan, and thank you for that great question. Yes, I think if Antony and Cleopatra had won, the empire would have tilted towards the east. The center of gravity would have been in the east. And uh, Octavian, excuse me, Antony would have gone back to what he was trying to do when Octavian interrupted him by declaring war. That is, he would have gone back to war with Parthia. Uh, he had a real prospect of uh, going back to where he'd been defeated in the past to what is to media, to what is nowadays Northwestern Iran. Uh, and because of a new set of alliances, he had a real opportunity to conquer some of that and to perhaps to move southward into what nowadays is Northern Iraq. I think that would have been his goal. As it was, the Romans have a recurring obsession with conquering Mesopotamia and it comes back again and again and again and again over the centuries. I think it would have loomed much larger. I think Greek, which even under Octavian and his successors, Greek was very important in the Roman Empire. It was really a Greco-Roman Empire. I think Greek would have become even more important I'm not sure the Romans would ever have conquered Britain. I don't know how important that would have been to them. They might not have made the effort in Germany that they did, ultimately a failed effort, but that might have been less important as well. And whatever religion developed in the Roman Empire, whether it would, would have been Christianity or something else, I think the culture of the Roman Empire would have been more like the culture of Byzantium. It would have been more like the culture of the Orthodox world than of the Latin Christian world. And I think the West today would be more like the Orthodox world than it is the Latin Christian world. English, would, might, for instance, might be a language with Greek roots rather than Latin roots. It would just be one of the ways in which the world would have been uh, very different. So yeah, a, a real eastward tilt with, with great cultural and political significance. Well, that was a... Uh... A brilliant question that got fascinating conjecture. Thank you both for that. Okay. Professor Tucker, you've been patient and great to see you. You have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Actium, at least in popular culture, is remembered for ending the civil wars and for uh, ending republicanism in Rome. Um, both may not be absolutely precise. Certainly there was a bit of um, 
uh, local democracy continuing in city states and so on. Uh, but uh, what I would like to ask is a variation on the previous question or, or, or Pascal's wager on Cleopatra's nose. Mm -hmm. uh, how different would that have been uh, it, had Actium went the other way? Uh, would there not have been also the end of the civil wars and also the end of republicanism uh, in Rome? Uh, you, you, you mentioned that there would have been a shift towards the East, uh, but other than that, sort of sort of thing that we value today about the, the end of the Republic, the question that the founders of the United States had, uh, did it have to be that way? Uh, would that have changed anything? And it's kind of a quick follow-up, I mean, something just occurred to me, uh, you know, the Roman Empire lasted, the Western Roman Empire lasted another 500 years, the Eastern a millennia and a half. They went through total ethnic changes, religious change, and so on. Nobody ever came up with, hey, why don't we try to go back to the Republic? You know, a millennia and a half, nobody thought about why shouldn't we go back and, and try the Republic again? I mean, has, the, the, all these empires were not always so great. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. I think the problem with the Republic is that the Republic failed to ad adapt adapt to a changing world. I mean, it's a cliche, but I think it's true that the government of a republic was set up to govern a city state and it wasn't suited to govern an empire, but it's not really a matter of administration. The real problem that the republic had was this inability to admit the elites of the empire to some sort of political governing position. Um, the, the people who ran the Roman Republic, the conservatives of the Roman Republic, the ones who the American founders admired, uh, in my opinion, they misunderstood them, maybe in creative and wonderful ways. Um, but people like Cato the Younger and, and Cicero, uh, they thought the provincial elites were scum. They didn't want to admit them. They thought they could go on governing this empire of 50 million people with just a few hundred people, uh, maybe a hundred families, and a few admit be admitted to the inner circle but they thought this, the party was gonna go on and that was just simply impossible. You couldn't govern the empire that way. And the tragedy of the Roman Republic is that it took, um, it, it took egotists like Pompey and Caesar to see what was necessary to be done, that you needed to reach out uh, to the people that you had conquered because you, you simply couldn't govern such a large empire without the participation, the active, participation of the local elites. And to get that, you had to make deals with them and reach out to them. And that's, that's the real pity. If the Republican elite had understood this and been um, flexible as Rome, Romans had been earlier in the Republic, I think they could have kept some form of oligarchy, um, which is what they would have liked to have had, and some form of political freedom at the top and freedom of speech at the top, which is what they lose when they get the Caesars and the monarchy. But, but unfortunately, they left history, Cleo, no choice. Uh, the only way to keep the empire was to have a monarchy and, and to limit freedom of speech, which is really a great tragedy. But no, they, they couldn't have gone back to the Republic, not as it was. Thank you, Avi. Thanks, Barry. Can we go back to you, Fritz? Uh, yes. Um, unfortunately, the two uh, previous uh, distinguished questioners uh, grabbed the questions I was going to ask. So I'm going to say GMTA, I guess. But so let me take a little different spin on it. Your books so often, they, they either deal with key moments in history um, or they deal with key individuals who are changing history, all, could have altered history one way or another. And, and Actium is for anybody who's studied it. It's obviously key, as your answers show, right. for world-changing events. Have you thought about writing an alternate history, given, <laughs> given that alternate histories not only may sell well, but alternate histories also can instruct very well? It's a really good question. I actually originally my last chapter was an alternate history uh and my editor talked me out of it uh, no. so did some of my friends so did some of my friends who oh were no um it was very speculative it was really speculative uh 
of course it's speculative, but it, it, it challenges, but, but again, it challenges people, you know, too many people look at, well, this is the way things happen. Of course they happen this way. Um, sometimes, you know, in personal social forces, direct history, individuals don't matter as much and so on. Well, at Actium, you know, social forces only take you so far and then it's individuals. Right. Yeah. So, no, I, uh, yeah. I try to bring that out in the book and no, undoubtedly there are ways to, to bring it out even further. I did contribute to a volume of counterfactual history uh, to several, I think, and one was on, the, I, I did one on the Battle of Salamis um, and how could that have gone the other way? I think counterfactual history is great because it forces you to ask, well, why did things happen the way that they did? I mean, when, one of the things I got from the counterfactual history that I never published on, on, on Actium, uh, the counterfactual I did was on Salamis, excuse me, I might have misspoken before, but by uh, writing a draft counterfactual history uh, cha chapter, um, it forced me to say, well, what, how important was this battle? Because there is a school of thought that would say, Anthony, Octavian, no difference. Two thugs, you know, one wins, the other wins, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think that's really wrong. It forced me to see, to see that. Uh, the other thing about counterfactual history, or maybe more of your question about personality, is um, personality is so important. I mean, Antony and Cleopatra had the tools to win this war. They really did. They just didn't know how to use them, or to some extent, they were fighting each other politically uh, in, in the deployment of these tools. I think Antony should have invaded Italy. I think that would have, uh, I think that would have won it for him. Uh, Octavian wasn't fated to win. And the fact that he does win is such a tribute to his skills as a politician and as a strategist. He's not much of a, a field commander, not much at all, um, but he knows his weaknesses, he knows his limitations, and he gets this tremendous partner in Agrippa, and he knows how to balance the relationship between the two. Uh, these are tremendously difficult skills to pull off, and um, the fact that he does it, uh, I just am in awe of the guy that he, he, could, he could pull this off. All right, so then the task is for the paperback edition, <laughs> to get the restored chapter, Simon and Schuster makes more money uh, because people want to run out and find out what could have happened. But uh, you know, editors are editors. I know, and, and unfortunately, they they sometimes uh, intrude a little too much. I would love yeah, to have my, seen. My, my, let me just say, my editor is a fantastic editor, and I who is it? Uh, his name is Bob Bender, and I. Oh, told, okay, yeah. I totally trust his judgment, so I, I was really happy to go with him on this. So, right. so, so uh, thank you, Fritz, and thank you for that exchange. Uh, Jonathan Rausch in chat, you know, there are at least 10 reasons why we adore the person and the work of Jonathan, uh, but now there are 11. <laughs> uh, Jonathan having just suggested, wouldn't it be spectacular if Professor Strauss would consider publishing this unpublished chapter with American purpose, that seed is planted okay. and, and we'll, we'll hunt you, Professor Strauss, because that would be a real gem and uh, more soon on that. Uh, we are almost done. I'm gonna put myself one last question, which returns to material covered, but, but it's very interesting to me. You, Barry, say in the book, and you said in the Zoom conversation, that the role of women in yeah. ancient military history is of great interest to you. Let yeah. me read a quote. This takes us back to something you discussed earlier. I wouldn't mind hearing just a little bit more. Here's the quote from the book. You say, quote, as marriages go, Octavia's experience with Mark Antony had been a disaster. Betrayal, humiliation, abandonment. But the marriage had also brought her motherhood, political power, celebrity, travel, and the odd deification. It had ended badly, but how many other divorcees could say that they had twice saved the Roman world from civil war? You end that passage by saying she had done as much for the House of the Caesars as any military commander. Wow. Could you just say a little bit more about her and her role in your book and your account? Yeah, I, she plays a really important role. Uh, first of all, her marriage with Antony 
in 40, uh, seals the deal to avoid a civil war between Octavian and Antony. Uh, and then several years later, the two men almost came to blows again, and Octavia saves the day. Uh, she, they, they were living, she and Antony were living in Athens. She comes to Southern Italy where uh, Antony is with his navy and where her brother is with his army. And she negotiates between the two of them. She's the go-between who strikes the deal that avoids a civil war. The deal is a little bit more favorable to her brother than it is to her husband, uh, but she negotiates that deal as well. Uh, I, that's in the ancient sources. I speculate that, um, I speculate that she's feeding intelligence to her brother uh, while all of this is, is going on uh, again. Yeah, I think she is acting as an agent. Um, the, uh, the sources mostly uh, portray her as a, uh, a woman uh, who had been done wrong. He'd done her wrong. Uh, and she's nothing other than the perfect wife uh, to Antony and he betrays her with Cleopatra. But good old Tacitus writing later uh, describes the marriage as a, um, as a treacherous liaison. And I'm sorry that I forget the Latin phrase that he, he uses. He's the only one who says what I was thinking, which is that it's just too suspicious. Also the family she comes from, she comes from this family and her mother was an incredible political operator. Uh, and you know, her, um, uh, they're all, it's a political family. I don't believe for a minute that she is just, just an innocent uh, wife sitting at home, a perfect Roman matron spinning for her husband uh, and not taking part in politics. There's also her earlier marriage, uh, her earlier marriage to Marcellus, who very suspiciously, at the beginning of the Civil War with uh, Pompey and Caesar, he starts out as a, as a, a, a very strong opponent of Caesar and supporter of Pompey and Cato, and then somehow, magically, he changes sides and goes over to, to Caesar's side. I suspect his wife had something to do with negotiating that. Um, this is, this is a, a light motif in her career. So I think she's greatly underestimated. I'm not the only person who thinks so. There have been, there have been uh, other scholars who've written about her uh, as and her agency as a woman, but I think I've gone further than anyone in seeing her as a political agent. While this is going on. So you all, that brings us to one minute before 1 p.m. Eastern at our hard stop. Uh, I found that dazzling and refreshing and reviving. What a wonderful hour. Professor Barry Strauss, thank you so much. Congratulations thank on this you. splendid book. Yeah. I hold it up again if you can see it on my Zoom screen. It's 2022, Simon and Schuster, The War That Made the Roman Empire. It's a great read. What a lovely conversation. Thank everybody for being with us today. And Barry, Godspeed, congratulations. Thank and uh, we look forward to seeing that chapter for publication <laughs> for American Purpose. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Thanks Bye. so much.